Hi, this is a video about amino acid condensation and hydrolysis and the levels of protein structure. The proteins that make up the cells and structures of our body are made from amino acid building blocks. We're going to see condensation and hydrolysis reactions just like the ones that you've seen before, except this time we're going to take amino acids and make polypeptides or proteins. You've seen condensation before in chapter 6 and chapter 7. In chapter 6 we talked about monosaccharides condensing to make disaccharides or polysaccharides. This reaction creates water and a glycosidic bond. And its opposite reaction is hydrolysis, when we can take one large unit and break one of the bonds with water. We saw this a second time when we took glycerol and three fatty acids to make triglycerides and three water molecules. This was again a condensation reaction, and this time the new bond was an ester bond, and it created an ester functional group. The opposite reaction is breaking bonds with water, and it is a hydrolysis. Now we're going to take two amino acids. We're going to remove an oxygen from one of the units and two hydrogens from the second unit to make water and a new bond. This time the new bond is called a peptide bond, and it's part of a new functional group called an amide functional group. Condensation of amino acids creates a new type of molecule called a polypeptide, but it's often referred to simply as a peptide. You can specify how many amino acids are in the peptide with a prefix like di, tri, or tetra. The peptide shown here is actually a dipeptide. The opposite reaction, using water to cut the peptide bond, is hydrolysis. Take a moment now to review the information that's on the activity and try to answer the questions. If you need to review the previous material in Chapter 6 and Chapter 7, or if you need to review your functional groups, do it now. Please check the key to make sure your answers are correct. We're going to move on to a new part of the activity where we talk about the levels of protein structure. This is a figure from your textbook that shows four different levels of protein structure. The primary structure is a sequence of amino acids. The secondary structure is the shape that the amino acids form. Tertiary structure is the overall shape of the entire protein, and quaternary structure is characterized by multiple protein chains coming together to make a new, larger structure. Let's start at primary structure. Here's the structure of a polypeptide. This one is a pentapeptide because it's five amino acids. On this figure, I've highlighted the backbone atoms in blue. These are the atoms that do not depend on the identity of the amino acid. So all amino acids have these groups in common. Here are the backbone atoms of glycine, and a new peptide bond here links glycine to alanine. Here are the backbone atoms of alanine. Here's the new peptide bond between alanine and asparagine, and here are the backbone atoms of asparagine, and so on. The side chains are highlighted in black. So this is the side chain of glycine, this is the side chain of alanine, side chain of asparagine, etc. The primary structure of this peptide is defined by its sequence, glycine, alanine, asparagine, cysteine, and leucine, linked together in this specific order. Please take a moment to highlight the backbone atoms in the figure in your activity. Whether I draw the structure of a peptide, like the one shown here, or I just write the order of the amino acids, like I have done down here, I always draw or write the N-terminal amino acid on the left-hand side and the C-terminal amino acid on the right-hand side. The N-terminal amino acid is the one at the end of the chain that has the unlinked and protonated primary amine. And the C-terminal or C-terminus N is the end that has the amino acid with an unlinked carbonyl or carboxylate functional group. Take a moment to label the N-terminal and C-terminal ends on your structure. The N-terminal amino acid will always be written on the left-hand side, and the C-terminal amino acid will always be written on the right. Therefore, if I just write a sequence of amino acid abbreviations, you always assume the N-terminal amino acid is left and the C-terminal amino acid is right. For this reason, if I reverse the order of this amino acid chain, I would not be writing the same peptide. It would be a different peptide because it would have a different primary sequence. Please take a moment now and answer the questions on this part of the activity. Check the key to make sure you're correct before moving on. Primary structure is the sequence of the amino acids 
in the peptide backbone. Now let's talk about secondary structure. When you have a chain of amino acids, they will either coil upon each other or they will zigzag back and forth. This is a picture of secondary structure called an alpha helix. Here is the ball and stick model of the alpha helix. The backbone groups are the black carbon atoms and blue nitrogen atoms in this figure. Secondary structure occurs because of hydrogen bonding between amide hydrogens and carbonyl oxygens of the backbone atoms. In the alpha helix, there is always a hydrogen bond between the first amino acid's amide hydrogen and the fifth amino acid's carbonyl oxygen. This pattern of a one to five or two to six or three to seven amino acid interaction continues for the length of the alpha helix. Alpha helices are easier to draw in a ribbon structure than a ball and stick model. Here's the ball and stick model showing the hydrogen bonding, the peptide bonds, and the polypeptide backbone. The peptide backbone in an alpha helix wraps upon itself kind of like a spiral in a notebook or a spiral telephone cord. And it's easy to represent it with a spiral ribbon. Here is the backbone ball and stick model overlaid with the ribbon diagram. And over here is just the ribbon diagram. You'll often see peptide backbones or proteins represented through these ribbon diagrams because they're easier to interpret. It's understood that the backbone atoms are interacting here even though they're not shown. This alpha helix ribbon structure is another representation for the ball and stick model. This is another type of secondary structure called a beta sheet. Once again, the secondary structure is caused by interactions between the backbone atoms. There are hydrogen bonds between the amide hydrogens and the carbonyl oxygens of backbone atoms. A beta sheet looks different from the alpha helix. This is not a spiral. Rather, the peptide backbone is zigzagging back upon itself and it makes a sheet-like structure. This is the ball and stick model that shows hydrogen bonding between amide hydrogens and carbonyl oxygens. And this is the ribbon diagram showing that the peptide chain is zigzagging back and forth. It makes this sheet-like structure. Here you see the two representations overlaid. There's no repeating pattern in a beta sheet like there is in an alpha helix. But the two things are similar in the fact that they are secondary structure that is caused by hydrogen bonding between backbone atoms. Please take a moment now to answer the questions in this part of the activity. Check the key to make sure you're correct before moving on. Before we move on, I want to point out one more time that secondary structure is caused by hydrogen bonding between backbone atoms. The next level of protein structure, tertiary structure, is caused by interactions between side chain atoms rather than backbone atoms. Here are two figures that represent tertiary structure. Tertiary structure is the overall fold of a protein, and the overall fold or shape of the protein is specific for each protein. It's defined by the secondary and primary structure, but it's caused by interactions between side chain atoms. Interaction between side chain atoms can be any of the attractive forces that we learned about in a previous activity. These range from London forces all the way up to ionic interactions. Shown in the figure on the bottom right hand side here, this figure is showing that two phenylalanine side chains are interacting through something called a hydrophobic interaction. This is the same as London forces. When we talk about proteins, London forces are often referred to as hydrophobic interactions. And here's another example. Two alanine hydrocarbon side chains can interact through London forces or hydrophobic interactions. All of the amino acid polar side chains are also capable of hydrogen bonding. So the next most important interaction is going to be a hydrogen bonding interaction. Here we see the hydrogen bonding interaction between two serine side chains. And over here you see hydrogen bonding between a carboxylate and an amine side chain. You can also have hydrogen bonding between water and amino acid side chains. In fact, this is a very important factor that goes into protein folding. The outside surface of a protein is usually hydrophilic or it's capable of hydrogen bonding to water. And the core of the protein will be hydrophobic. 
so that when the protein meets water, it will fold into the correct structure where the hydrophilic or water-loving amino acid side chains are on the outside and the hydrophobic or uh, water-fearing amino acids are on the inside. You'll also see ionic interactions between side chains. And here is an, a representation of an ionic interaction between a protonated amine and a carboxylate side chain. When we talk about ionic interactions between amino acids and proteins, we often refer to them as salt bridges. So salt bridge and ionic interactions are the same thing. There's one additional type of interaction between side chains, and this is not an attractive force. This is actually a, caused by a chemical reaction between cysteine side chains. Cysteines will form disulfide bonds. Please refer to the figure on your activity to see the oxidation reaction that occurs between cysteine side chains to form disulfide bonds. This reaction is reversible depending on the conditions. Under oxidizing conditions, disulfides will form, but under reducing conditions, disulfides will be converted back into cysteines. A ribbon diagram of a protein is shown up here. I'd like to take a moment to really to make sure that you understand what a ribbon diagram means. I'm using the program Chimera to view a protein structure. There are a lot of atoms on this page. I'd like you to focus over here. This is the C-terminal amino acid of this protein chain, and it looks like it's a glutamate. I'm gonna zoom out now so that you can see more of this protein. Here's the whole protein. It's complicated and it's hard to look at. One way that we can simplify this to understand what the structure looks like is by removing the side chain atoms. There, that's a little easier to look at. Now let's rotate it again. Still, by looking at only the backbone atoms, it's hard to see the secondary and tertiary structure of this protein. And this is where ribbon diagrams come into play. Now I will highlight the ribbon diagram. The ribbon diagram shows the secondary and tertiary structure of this protein. And it's a lot easier to look at than the actual ball and stick models. This is why scientists use ribbon diagrams. They're simplifications and they're helpful. I'll rotate this protein again so that you can see what's happening. Now I can add the side chains back onto this so that we can see them again. Even now we can see a little bit better what's going on because of the ribbon diagram is showing what's happening with the backbone atoms. There's one more representation of protein structure that I'd like you to see. And that's the surface. If you were a little molecule, this is what you would see looking at the protein. It's the electron density surface of the protein. I'm going to make this partially transparent so that you can see the ribbon diagram and the side chain atoms again. There it is. Here we can see the surface, or the electron density surface, of the proteins. Remember, all of these atoms are really surrounded by electrons. So the electron density surface is showing you all the space that the electrons around the atoms are taking up. I'll rotate this one more time. And here it is with just the ribbon diagram and the surface. You can look at these yourself if you download Chimera and open the protein data bank online. You can look at all the proteins whose structures are known. There are a lot of them. So now that we have a little bit better idea of what these ribbon diagrams are, perhaps this structure makes a little more sense. Please take a moment to answer the questions in your activity and check the key to make sure that you're correct before moving on to quaternary structure. All right, so far we've seen primary structure, which is the sequence of the amino acids, Secondary structure, which is caused by hydrogen bonding between peptide backbone atoms. Tertiary structure, which is caused by attractive forces or covalent bonds between side chain atoms and represents the overall fold of the protein. Now we're going to talk about quaternary structure. Quaternary structure is featured by multiple protein chains coming together. Quaternary structure is characterized by the same types of interactions that define tertiary structure, except the interactions are between side chain atoms of different protein chains. The cartoon shown in your book is actually a cartoon of hemoglobin. It shows two different protein chains in purple and two different protein chains in gray. Hemoglobin is the protein in your blood that carries oxygen. It actually binds to a small molecule, which is represented by these little squares. 
and the oxygen binds right here on this small molecule. But hemoglobin only works if there are four proteins of hemoglobin that come together and form a quaternary structure. Now I'll show you the ribbon diagram for hemoglobin. And you could also look this up in the protein data bank and look at it yourself on your computer with Chimera. In this figure, the small molecule called a porphyrin is shown and oxygen is actually shown bound here. The oxygen is the red molecule here, 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 and here. There are four different proteins that come together to make this functional hemoglobin. So each one of these proteins is shown in a different color. The interactions that bring the proteins together defines the quaternary structure, and they're the same types of interactions that you saw with tertiary structure, except the interactions between two different protein chains are the quaternary interactions. Here's another example. This one is of a potassium channel. The potassium channel is also four different proteins. And let me point out now that it's a co coincidence that I sh just showed you two different proteins that have four proteins each. Quaternary structure does not have to have four proteins. It could be just two or just three. The potassium channel is the channel in your cell membrane that allows potassium to flow through the cell membrane. Remember, potassium is an ion. It cannot get through the lipid bilayer without a protein channel. Here's the protein channel and it lies within the membrane. And here's the top view where you can see the channel which potassium can flow through. The interactions between the different colored subunits here would be the quaternary structure. Every one of these different colored proteins is actually the same type of protein, but you need four of them to make the active channel. Thanks for watching this video on condensation and hydrolysis of amino acids and the levels of protein structure. If you have any questions, feel free to post them in the comment section. And please let me know if this video is helpful by giving me a vote.